Welcome everyone to this, um, what originally was supposed to be in-person author meets critic session, um, but we had to move due to COVID um, of, um, well, the, the, the main author over here um, and, and, and a couple of other people to do it online. Um, and we hope this is going to work well and you are all going to hear us and, and, and most importantly that Jonas and, and Lucio will be able to hear uh, people there in the room. So um, the, 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 we, the, the session is on the edited book, um, Diminishing Returns, The New Politics of Growth and Stagflation, edited by Lucio Baccaro, Mark Light and Jonas Pontesson, that came out into this year actually with OUP. Uh, we are going to have three discussants, um, Alex um, Afonso, one of the network coordinators as well here who will introduce the book and then um, give some of his comments, followed by Walter Schelkle from LSE um, and Manuela Morshella from Scuola Normale Superiore. Uh, and then um, after that, we will have the, uh, we will have Jonas and, and, and Lucio um, respond to the comments and only then we will open the floor for, for questions from the audience. Um, please raise your hands if uh, once we start with the questions. Um, you can also type them up if you prefer so in the chat and, and, and then we can take them up from there. So Alex, I hand you the floor. So thank you very much. It's a bit of a schizophrenic session for me because the main protagonists and the authors of the book are online. We have uh, quite a big audience. I can also tell the, the authors uh, here in the room. So I hope, uh, I hope we will be able to do this in an efficient way. Um, so I, I, I am one of the discussants, but what I will do is also provide a very brief uh, kind of presentation of the book, uh, which is going to come out later this year, if I got it correctly. Uh, we, we got a, 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 a proofs, uh, the discussants, to, 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 uh, to read the book. It's quite a big book. It's 500 uh, pages, so it's going to be quite a challenge also to provide comments on such a groundbreaking, path-breaking, uh, paradigm-shifting kind of book in such a short um, uh, amount of time, but uh, I, I will try to do uh, my best. Um, so, Diminishing Returns uh, is an attempt to systematize into a single volume a research agenda that many of us have actually been following for a number of years uh, that has been uh, underway under the leadership of notably um, Lucio Baccaro, Jonas Pontuson, that have been joined by also uh, Mark Blythe uh, in this book to no less than renew the field of comparative political economy. Uh, here, I don't, I don't think it's exaggerated to say that the book seeks to trigger a parad paradigmatic shift uh, in the discipline in a way that hasn't been attempted uh, for uh, maybe two decades, I guess, since the of capitalism. And, and as I think the discussions will, will uh, argue, this is one of the biggest, the biggest contender to replace um, Vartis of capitalism as the dominant paradigm in the analysis of comparative capitalism. So uh, I guess it's appropriate to provide some context uh, to the book. Um, at the beginning of every Star Wars episode, there is a text scrolling down that basically summarizes what has been going on beforehand, uh, which, uh, who is uh, ruling at the moment, who is in exile at the moment, and whose power is declining and whose power ri is, is uh, rising. So I guess what I will be doing now is provide a very brief uh, scrolling text uh, for, for the book uh, to try to situate essentially within the field of comparative uh, political economy. I guess that uh, the scrolling text would sound a little bit like uh, um, the field of comparative political economy has been in a sort of interregnum uh, for, a number of, for a number of years that has been characterized by uh, the um, steady exhaustion of the Hall and Soskis uh, empire or, or paradigm. Uh, for, for most of you, uh, you are familiar with the values of capitalism framework that uh, essentially emerged from a research agenda studied in the 1990s by David Soskis, systematized in a book in 2001. And a lot of the um, assumptions of the paradigm were very marked by the period in which it was uh, developed. 
So, Valdis Capitalism emerged in 2001, drawing on work by Soskis and Hall throughout the 1990s, and it was also very much embedded in the kind of zeitgeist of the late 90s that were very strongly uh, shaped, even not very explicitly, by uh, the supply side kind of paradigm. Uh, where, uh, as we'll argue a bit later, a lot of the assumptions of uh, the varieties of capitalism framework were essentially oriented towards um, um, supply-side institutions. Well, that's really what mattered. Now, in the meantime, and as the authors uh, of um, diminishing returns make clear, we faced quite a lot of uh, uh, changes in the, in the economy, uh, secular stagnation that was already going on, but has really been uh, accentuated with the, with the global financial crisis and the global financial crisis, which also raised a number of um, anomalies within the Varieties of Capitalism Framework. So, so the framework proposed in this book, in Diminishing Returns, the, 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 growth, uh, the growth model perspective, tries to draw on, to really build on the anomalies and, and the problems that have emerged within the Varieties of Capitalism Framework and try to connect it uh, with um, developments in macroeconomics. That's one of the big building blocks, I think, of the book, is to try to draw on a renewed uh, macroeconomic framework and macroeconomic assumptions, and also take it more to the global stage. That's, I think, the main contribution of, of uh, um, people like uh, in IP, like Mark Bly, uh, with one of the editors, but also contributions by Matthias Matthijs uh, and others. So I think the book really makes three broad contributions within this broader context. The first is to try to take uh, macroeconomics seriously. And, and to shift the focus of comparative political economy from uh, supply-side politics or supply-side political economy to demand-side political economy. So in many ways, the VOC approach was embedded in supply-side zeitgeist of the 1990s, as I said before. Uh, so VOC drew on a neoclassical assumption that competitiveness in some way could be achieved, achieved by the right combination of institutions that uh, essentially structure the kind of products that different countries were able to produce. Uh, so that was essentially a supply side approach, uh, as I said, and they were not really concerned, at least explicitly at the beginning, with how demand for all these goods that could be generated uh, in the global economy uh, would, be, uh, would, be, would be created uh, in the first place. So the set of institutions, uh, essentially explain why certain countries produce certain kind of goods, Silicon Valley in the US, um, BMWs and, uh, and Mercedes in Germany, and what kind of institutions different countries had developed to achieve the product, to, to provide, to be competitive in world markets by the right combination of institutions. Um, now, the trend towards lower, grades, uh, lower rates of growth that, has, that's, that, uh, that the authors also talk about very much in the beginning through different approaches, notably drawing on, on approaches in, from uh, um, post-Keynesian economics and, and other changes in the economy, notably the chapter by, by Hermann Schwartz, talks about the turn to, to the uh, franchise economy. Uh, I've made quite clear that this approach focusing on the supply side only is insufficient to actually explain broad changes that we've been, uh, all been seeing uh, in the global economy. So they, they've really tried to shift the focus from the supply side level to how do different countries solve the problem of generating aggregate demand. So that's the main focus and I think the main starting point on which uh, the approach draws on that is really quite different from the varieties of capitalism approach. And I think this is uh, one of these uh, biggest uh, strengths. Um, so, in order to, to, to try to uh, build and, and, and strengthen this shift towards the demand side, uh, the authors draw on insights from post-Keynesian economics, uh, which, which uh, has a number of advantages in relation to the neoclassical foundations of artist capitalism. So, artist capitalism, and that's one of the main big critiques that have been uh, leveraged against it is that it it's really saw capitalism as something inherently stable and path dependent uh, with combination of institutions that reinforce themselves. So the, one of the implicit assumptions was that there would be some return to some form of equilibrium that would be relatively stable uh, with 
a, a quite pervasive metaphor uh, towards biology and natural selection to, uh, to explain institutional change uh, and persistence. One of the core assumptions was that capitalism actually is relatively stable, works relatively well in some way if we believe the latest contributions by uh, Holland Iverson in their recent book uh, with uh, Princeton University Press, I believe, which, which uh, the authors also uh, engage with in their, uh, in their, in their introduction. Um, Baccaro, Pontuson, and, and Blythe uh, re well, move away from this assumption of equilibrium to draw on post-Keynesian post uh, uh, macroeconomics to conceive of capitalism as essentially unstable. So this idea that there would be a return to equilibrium, and in spite of the fact that Vartis capitalism tried to provide this alternative approach to uh, the economy that was different from those from neoclassical economics still was very much embedded in these core assumptions and didn't really challenge them. So that's how uh, uh, diminishing returns try to challenge these drawing on, 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 uh, on uh, these new approaches of post-Kintian economics that don't really conceive of a natural return to equilibrium but conceive of institutions as essentially unstable uh, which actually fits quite well with what we've seen with a, a succession of crises. Now we might have the return of uh, a high inflation uh, period, uh, we, which I think is, is quite strong as well in, in this perspective. So what, what, uh, what the authors bring forward is uh, try to explain essentially um, instead of the two typologies that VOC uh, proposed between coordinated market economies and liberal market economies, they have a, a, a typology with a greater number of types which can essentially be conceived as different formulas countries have come up with to resolve at the local and uh, in a relatively unstable manner how they've tried to solve the problem of generating aggregate demand at the domestic level. Um, the typology they propose uh, is, is um, countries that essentially draw on um, domestic demand essentially through debt. So uh, in the face of uh, secular stagnation and the decline and the exhaustion of the wage-led growth model that characterized the post-war period, uh, some countries in the face of these, uh, of these trends uh, have essentially relied on essentially housing or uh, consumption uh, credit if we think about the US or, or Spain, uh, which this model really embodies pretty well the idea of the instability of capitalism if we think about the, the phases of uh, boom and bust growth and, 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 uh, and, uh, that, have, um, that have happened in, in a number of countries also around the world uh, when these asset price bubbles eventually burst. So that's a, quite a good embodiment of, of this uh, departure from the assumption of, uh, of uh, equilibrium. The second type is uh, export-led growth that corresponds relatively well to the coordinate market uh, economy model uh, of VOC, where uh, the way you generate demand, essentially you don't, you uh, repress uh, domestic demand to ensure uh, cost competitiveness and you draw on exports, that is demand uh, uh, coming uh, from abroad. Then you have some hybrid models. Uh, there's a chapter by, uh, by, um, by Pontusson and Ericsson on Sweden, uh, where they um, present how these two strategies of both consumption-led and export-led growth can be combined in a relatively uh, coherent uh, manner. And then uh, there's a number of uh, peripheral models, uh, comprado uh, um, um, economies will rely on their position between core countries, essentially, and taking advantage of the spillover effects of some core uh, countries. There's notably uh, the article by uh, Cornel Ban and Dragos uh, Adaskalitai on, on Romania, and the Hotebola and Aiden Regan on Ireland and um, Latvia, is it, I think, uh, uh, that essentially um, depend on their position within the global economy. And that, that takes me to uh, one of the, the second, essentially, bigger contribution uh, and advancement of the model is the, the, the idea of taking the global economy uh, seriously and the embeddedness of national models into global 
power relationship. So that's the, the, the connection uh, with, uh, with, with the IPE uh, model. Um, so, so that's uh, uh, quite a great, I think, contribution of the model in the sense that it, it departs from the methodological nationalism that uh, many have, have criticized in the VOC approach by uh, looking at how um, different capitalist models are not separated from each other and are not atomized, but are embedded in global power relationships and how some capitalist models depend on their position and power relationships and relationships of dependence towards other uh, bigger ones. So the idea of co-periphery, I think, is one of the important uh, contributions also in the, in the, in the book. Um, There's notably uh, 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 the, the, this, the, the role of finance is taken seriously, whereas it was not very, um, not really taken into account in the VSC model, and also the role of uh, international macroeconomic regimes. So, for those of you who have been interested in, in, in the European political economy literature, there's notably a very good uh, chapter by uh, Alison Johnson and Matthias Matthijs on the EU uh, macroeconomic regime and how it advantages some growth models rather than others. So, the, asymmetry, uh, the asymmetric relationship between different models here uh, is taken seriously. So first contribution, new uh, renewed macroeconomic foundations. The second is uh, taking the international economy and, and global interdependencies uh, seriously. Something that uh, VOC, I think, didn't really ignore, but it tended to, con to really consider globalization as this exogenous factor that, uh, that uh, exerted pressure on national, uh, on national capitalist models through the kind of relatively vague pressure of competitiveness, which is the main driver of, 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 of uh, supposedly what versus capitalism did, whereas uh, I think the growth, um, the growth model perspective really takes much more seriously, takes advantage of latest developments in, in IPE research as well, whereas it was something that was a bit under-conceptualized uh, in the VOC model. Uh, the last uh, contribution, I think, and there are many, as I said, this is really a really big book and a really uh, important book that I think we will shape uh, the field for, for, uh, for a number of years to come, is uh, the idea of politics and the way of it conceives of politics. Uh, in the Vartis Capitalism approach, I think um, capitalism, and uh, essentially politics, electoral politics and party politics were essentially subordinate to the needs of competitiveness. So there was not really uh, uh, um, a really uh, very independent role, at least in my understanding, for politics as such. There was the firm that was at the center and politics and the electoral game was essentially a, a bit of a theatrical uh, game that was subordinate to the needs of uh, of uh, of uh, coordination amongst firms. This has led to uh, a form of backlash by some scholars in the field, notably people around the, the electoral turn, uh, and Pablo Beramendi, Cecilia Hoseman, uh, Herbert Kitschel, and Peter Krizi, that have taken, tried to take the field a bit in the opposite direction, and uh, essentially putting electoral politics at the center and presenting all other things like macroeconomic choices and policies as essentially subordinate to electoral politics. So I think the book really has one of its strengths as well, tries to take a, perhaps a middle way, but try to find a synthesis between these two extreme positions, either considering uh, electoral politics as subordinate to the needs of firms, or the politics of the macroeconomy as subordinate to uh, the electoral game. So they acknowledge that there are some um, constraints and some inherent problems and coordination issues that need to be solved within the, within the political economy. How do you generate demand uh, is, is the most important one in the, in, the, in, the, in the approach. And try to find, uh, but this doesn't need that these, uh, that these constraints within the macroeconomy can ignore the electoral game because you need to find some form of electoral legitimation. Uh, and this is not automatic, this is also uh, politically created. Uh, sometimes you have relatively small support coalitions for the current 
uh, growth, uh, growth model, so you need to find some way to sell it to the broader electorate. And I think that's, that's one of the also a very interesting contributions. Uh, that's notably the, the, the chapter by, um, by uh, Jonathan Hopkins and Dustin Voss that tries to conceptualize that and make a connection between growth models and uh, the nature of the electoral game and of party politics. So that's, I think, the, the three main contributions. As I said, this, this, this could be, uh, I could speak about this for five or six hours, but I think we are a bit at the end of the day. Uh, so I've tried to summarize this, the three main contributions. I would like to raise three points before uh, uh, giving the floor to the other discussants. Um, I was interested um, in, in the, the kind of trade-off in building typologies between um, parsimony on the one hand and accuracy on the other. I think one of the appeals of the Varieties of Capitalism framework was somehow its elegance. Uh, its elegance and parsimony and at the same time uh, if, if, you, if you draw on, on a, a very appealing and elegant theory it's very likely that you'll be bound to be wrong on quite a number of issues. And there's been a number of empirical tests of the core assumptions of the VOC approach that have uh, shown that, uh, that these assumptions were not really um, true uh, in the real world. At the same time, if you really want to account for the complexity of, uh, of, uh, of the complexity of the diversity of capitalist arrangements, you need to complexify and then you lose some appeal and the ability to, 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 for other scholars in particular to use the framework. So how, how do you deal with these, two, uh, with these two things and were there discussions about choices that had to be made? Notably, this notably relates to the number of, of types uh, that you opted for. So I could imagine uh, 50 different ways where aggregate demand uh, can, be, uh, ca can be constructed. Uh, how do you decide, how do you settle uh, did you settle on, on these specific uh, types? Um, are typologies still useful in the first place? So you opted uh, actually quite in a similar manner uh, to what Varitis Capitalism did on trying to build a typology where different countries could be fitted in. Um, would there be a way to, rather than doing at country classifications, trying to build some form of toolbox of policies that, uh, that countries could draw on and recombine. Is my, 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 this comes from the question that I had about whether building country classifications and typologies um, doesn't renew somehow the, the functionalist bias that Varitas of Capitalism had. Uh, if these arrangements of institutions are not necessarily functional and coherent with each other, why do we have to build these typologies where things fit together? So what are the pressures for, for different institutions to combine uh, with each other in the first place? Um, I have two more points. Um, I, I was uh, somewhat puzzled for a, an approach that draws so much on the importance of domestic demand um, there, there was very little concern for demographic, demographic factors like uh, fertility and, and it seems to me that many uh, consumption-led models also drew uh, to a great extent on population growth and this population growth, if you think about countries like Spain or, or the UK, uh, and that's mentioned partly in the country chapters, also drawn high levels of immigration. Immigration at maybe a professional deformation, because also what, what I work on was, was absent in, in, in much of the framework. I was wondering how there would be a way to integrate uh, uh, um, migration and, and, and this, which can shape also to a great extent uh, levels of domestic demand, at least in some countries. Uh, in the framework. And uh, in relation to that, my last point, uh, and that's maybe sometimes a bit of a shibboleth that can be leveraged against all frameworks, is uh, the role of, and, and, and segueing from migration, the role of um, gender. Uh, uh, the framework really presents the, the period of, um, of wage-led growth that followed World War II as maybe the only coherent uh, let's say a growth regime uh, that, has, that has emerged and then was replaced locally by uh, 
unstable local, uh, local regimes. Uh, but this model was also to a great extent premised on uh, particular gender roles and the high levels of wage growth and participation amongst uh, male white workers. Uh, is such a model of wage growth also possible when you extend uh, um, labor participation across um, more across the population and the entry uh, of women in the labor force? Sometimes I felt that this period was really idealized, like many, um, many, um, many, I think, political economists and even economists do as, as, as this golden era, but it, it does have quite significant uh, blind spots uh, and that, uh, that were to somehow based on some level of constraint and coercion as well. So that was uh, generally my comments. I, I will uh, leave the floor to the other discussants and uh, thank you very much. Walter is coming next. And Alex, um, I don't see how many people are in the room. This was supposed to be online session only, and now we are fully hybrid. So if you can make sure, Alex, that you see who wants to ask questions later on there, and I will, I will take care of those. Okay. Go ahead, Walter. Hello, everybody. Um, just for your information, I think there are about 50 people in the room. I mean, we have almost a full house. Um, Thank you all for your interest and thank you, Alex, for summarizing this book for us. Because, you know, this is a book of, of astonishing and enormous ambition. It obviously wants to replace VOC's grip on comparative political economy and much more. That's my little problem with it because it doesn't come across as such a compact research program as the one it wants to replace. I mean, I had a little, when I got the uncorrected um, proof from Lucio, I said to him, is the t who is, I wonder who is the title of this, the target of this title, diminishing returns. Is this targeted at, you know, research efforts in the VOC paradigm? Oh, no, 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 no. But it is clear that it is, of course, an attempt to replace VOC. Now, I think it can be attractive that one says it is not quite so reductionist as that one that had two worlds of capitalism or welfare capitalism, not worlds of capitalism, uh, and then invents at least two more because two don't quite do it. Uh, uh, here you have not Moses and the law, but the Bible, with three slightly different gospels as well at some sometimes, you know, St. Luke, St. Mark, and St. John. Um, that is also clear. It is not quite as coherent. What about um, Matthew? Yeah, Matthew, I wonder. I think Matthias would probably have go uh, gone with you, um, whether it would have been so different from St. Uh, Mark, I don't know. Um, let me therefore focus, and before you think that I'm now trashing this, uh, let me say that I'm all in favor of it. When I first saw the efforts by Lucio and, and Jonas uh, trying to mobilize Kalatsky and economics for this, I, I was all in favor because it has been long a problem for me that we have basically we get a neoclassical story and from and what they call new Keynesianism, which to me really is a new neoclassical synthesis, uh, but this term is, is, is common that it is new Keynesianism, which always gives me a little um, uh, shiver. Um, so I want to, I'm very intrigued by this ambition, and I want to convince you that it's important that polit political economists try to give a different, show that there can be different economic foundations for their study of comparative capitalism. Why should you care? Policy choices are a big part of democratic politics and you need to mobilize sometimes for the argument uh, economics that sees things differently and can justify different policy choices. And every grand ideology of polit European political economy, as Esping Anderson called it, so liberalism, social democracy, and conservatism, and therefore different political party, uh, party political ideologies can find some support in the schools of economic thought. It is not that only liberalism or conservatism 
have economics on their side. And that is a bit of a point of this article that you already mentioned, Alex, uh, Hopkin and Foss, that actually go a bit against this, that parties are not interested in growth models, which one could sometimes read in this. And I'm, I'm all in favor that we say they are not, and they need to, in the discussions that we have, they need to have some foundations in, in economics, and therefore it's important to provide it. Then finally, and this will be the point of my, my comments, economic schools can identify where the problem of capitalism and of capitalism for democracy lies. Which is the market that tends to create the problem? In neoclassical economics, it's always the labor market. Um, it eats into profits, right? In Marxism, it's funnily enough consumption, I think, that eats into capital accumulation. Now, Marx uh, you know, supported this, then that creates the demise of, of, of capitalism. But this, this uh, secular decline of, of, uh, of capitalism, or the secular decline of the profit rate has always to do with that there's overconsumption in a way. In Keynesianism, as I understand it, is financial markets. The interest rate is too high for full employment, and at some point even the, the, the want of holding liquidity creates depressions. That was Keynes' the general theory. So what I then miss in the book a bit is partly because it wants to do so much, and that would require another 500 uh, pages book, or at least 300. I miss the pluralism. I welcome that you have shown one alternative, and that's the post-Keynesian one, in particular in this chapter by Stockhammer and, and Onoran. It is not the only conceivable alternative. And let me tell you why I would not follow the post-Keynesian script, the Kaletsky and the regulation school script. Um, as preferable as it is, and I would go with you in that, to the uh, neoclassical synthesis, which really is just that, a neoclassical synthesis that we had with the ISLA model and so on. Um, wage levels together with prices determine the rest. Um, Stockhammer and Onoran summarize it nicely, what, what is the post-Keynesian uh, um, argument namely to show that demand determines growth in the long run and not only in the short business cycle uh, horizon. They say GDP, the income, is an implicit function of the wage share, so you have income distribution in there, private debt, that's how they introduce finance, and government spending. In a way, the visible hand of the state that is also famously neglected by the firm perspective of VOC. And that nails down what is more dispersed in the intro. However, the intro goes with that as well. So a marginal change in the wage share determines growth rates of all other variables via its dual effect on demand and productivity. However, the problem is, as they themselves say, the effect can be negative or positive of a wage increase in wage share. It depends on specific constellations. Does the cost effect that depresses growth uh, outweigh the demand effect that would increase growth? Uh, is there a spillover of higher demand into higher productivity? That's this uh, Verdun effect, uh, Kaletsky Verdun effect, um, or just inflation? So in a way, this wage share, what it does to GDP or the growth rate of GDP cannot be told in the PK, PK model. And I think there are, you need to discuss whether there are whether there are simplifications that would, would, would clarify this and then say it's open to empirical research, whether we find this or not. Above all, it means the wage share is not a policy variable, but an outcome of a whole chain of events itself determined by more fundamental variables, um, like the power of workers uh, to raise the wage share changes with the business cycle, as the uh, introduction also says. However, still a lot of time is, is spent on the importance of the wage share and its role in growth models. And just to illustrate my point, let me challenge here this Marxian way. I understand why you insist so much, because you want to have the distributive struggle right in the growth model. Um, this Marxian way of formulating the struggle over income distribution, namely workers against holders of capital and financial assets, as the introduction calls it, ironically assumes too much power of workers in capitalism, in my view. Keynesian economics formulates this distributive struggle as one between wealth owners, 
including intellectual property rights, as Hermann Mark Schwartz has, has shown, finance versus actors in non-financial sectors. The interest rate is a tax on value added in production of non-financial goods and services, hence paid by employers, investors, as well as employees. It is them against banks, if you will. Now, I find the, the Keynesian theory in a world of oversized financial markets much less mainstream than this post-Keynesian theory. Let me quote one thing from the introduction. Political exchange between labor and capital by which labor agrees to moderate its nominal wage demands in order to keep inflation uh, at moderate levels is the equilibrating mechanism at work in PK models, because it says there is a lot of disequilibrium. Well, only if this leads in Keynesian economics to lower interest rates risk premia, otherwise it is a version of a miserizing growth, which Germany has, for example, experienced for a while now. But what it also means, it is out of the control of wage bargainers uh, to stimulate growth with your wage bargains. Your PK explanation of secular stagnation actually refers to this contradiction of which classes or which sectors uh, much more closely to Keynesian than to the post-Keynesian one in the introduction. Which brings me to private debt as the way of including finance in comparative, in the study of comparative capitalism. It is mentioned in the context of the crisis of the wage-led growth model, left debt left only export and consumption-led, private debt sustains consumption. In some countries, corporate debt is the problem, for example, Spain, or was before. It looks at this from the demand side, while I think that, again, a Keynesian case can be made that, to say that finance is what constitutes supply side constraints. This is what Keynes had at the, as the diagnosis of the depression. It is the gatekeeper of employment and investment, and its demand for, uh, for interest rate allows how much investment and employment happens. The other thing is this nostalgia for the Trente Glorieuse and an ultimately quite con conventional story of its end, namely a wage price spiral, leaves out Piketty's insight that the early post-war years were characterized by the destruction of wealth through wars. There was no rentier class defending the return of on existing assets, but capitalist entrepreneurs who depended for profit generation, and there were plenty of opportunities for that, on the cooperation of workers, that it got through rising wages, but also co-determination at the workplace. But the growth came from a situation in which there was not these competing rentiers claims. The second problem with having private debt and they mean household debt as the, the, the key way of introducing um, finance into growth models leaves out all the stock flow dynamics. In other words, that that, that can explain the instability of capitalist economies, rather than that distributive struggle over wages and profits. You show in a way that, and I, I find that an interesting thought, that all models are inherently unstable. Economics is defined on imbalanced flows, either consumption, exports, investment, that imply imbalances in stocks, in claims on each other, countries on each other, sectors on each other private, public, foreign debt accumulation, which must end if it, there is no countervailing process in almighty crash. So that can explain instability even when labor has been, uh, you know, competed into moderation for decades and even now only reacts, reacts to inflation, is not the cause of inflation these days. So again, just to tell you why I think there are alternative ways of doing this, to be fair, uh, the Stockhammer and Onoran have a more complex uh, sector, uh, uh, section on financialization than the consumption-led growth model suggests, but I fear that's almost too complex to see what its key role is, namely that gatekeeper of investment and employment. Which brings me then to the last variable. If I have the time, I don't quite know how long I am already speaking. I have about two minutes. Two minutes. Then... Um, I should be a bit shorter um, because I wanted to come in the end 
so you have a role for the state, uh, uh, but not all states are created equal. Interdependence, and that is an important uh, uh, thought. You know, no national growth model is an island of its own. They live in interdependence, something that I also found always uh, problematic in VOC, that they don't see that in a way um, the, 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 the export led and the consumption led are actually quite complementary if you just look at it from national accounting point of view. However, it creates inequality, and that is, again, I think, through financial markets. The EU in this context can only, is, of course, only conceived as an enemy of most, if not all, uh, uh, national growth models. We find a lot of criticism for the EU, the euro in this book. John, uh, Johnson and Mat uh, Alison and, and Matthias have been, been mentioned, and it's a great uh, ca uh, chapter with which I totally disagree. Um, <laughs> In the introduction, we find Italy settled with an overvalued exchange rate in the, in the euro area, and therefore it cannot change its growth model. What's the evidence for this? Italy's current account situation has been better since committing to the euro area than in the 20 years before. I mean, why it is now settled with an overvalued exchange rate? It had that forever. Your growth model story actually can be read against your own intentions as a justification of the EU. If the EU is a supranational policy regime that does not pander to national models, but is meant to correct for their inherent flaws as you described them, inflation, debt accumulation, rising welfare expenditure, including and increasingly to their negative externalities of one growth model on that of others, then that is, that is what the EU is there for and can actually uh, be a corrective of the inherent tendency of growth models to go in one way. If your analysis is correct, then executives in each of the countries with these crisis-prone models should actually opt for such a corrective supranational regime to unsettle the entrenched in interests that prevent corrective action uh, by them. Keynes himself foresaw such an international solution to national beggar thy neighbor policies already, the bank core. Um, obviously, neither the bank core then nor the euro now would do away with capitalism. That was not his concern. Then political, political economy analysis uh, is, is about a political system in historical time in, in a geopolitical space, not some model of its efficiency or its inadvertent demise that you otherwise have. Thank you very much. So if you, as you've seen, all works need to have the famous reviewer too. So you had a good taste of what the reviewer too looks like. <laughs> and you cannot think of a better one than Valtrod in this case. Um, but now we are back to, I think, uh, more, a, a more positive assessment. Um, let me start by saying that uh, I really like uh, reading the book. Uh, it is an extremely rich, uh, stimulating uh, and insightful book. Um, it's also more than that. You have heard it already from both Alex and Valtrad. Uh, as I wrote it down, it's a book with a mission. Um, and the mission is that of taking the place that the variety of capitalism framework has in the arts of comparative political economists. Um, and let me put it straight. Uh, the way I read it is that uh, the authors are, they are not putting here an alternative you know, to the variety of capitalism model. What they are putting out there is the correct model, right? So it's the way they put it is that even the, the correct way to look uh, at comparative capitalism. So the, the level of ambition is certainly uh, one of the plus uh, of, of this book and deserves the praise. Um, the, one of the other plus is that to achieve this ambitious goal, the list of contributing scholars is really amazing. Uh, I won't do any names here. Um, some of them are here in this room, but I won't do any names just to avoid to forget some of them, and I don't, don't want to do justice to the great colleagues uh, involved with the project. Um, if I may raise a point, talking uh, about the contributors, you know, uh, as a woman, uh, I appreciate that at least, uh, you know, n there are nine women out of 28 contributors, is it counted correctly? It's, it's a fairly decent uh, 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 result, uh, but of course we can also read it in another way. You might have been done more, but, you know, I, I was looking into the room, I was talking with Aidan Reagan that you probably w cannot see from here, but I was counting that there are seven women 
women in this room, uh, which probably can tell uh, about a bigger problem uh, we have in political economy. So that's something really to think about that probably goes beyond the work that uh, Lucio, Jonas, and Mark uh, have put together. But it's uh, something that uh, I wanted to alert all of us on. So the book is incredibly rich. Uh, so it's very difficult to choose the aspect uh, to comment on. I struggled a lot thinking about uh, what are the aspects I really want to shed, uh, shed light on uh, in my remarks. Uh, but ultimately, I settled on three aspects. Um, these aspects are not just my personal takeaways. Uh, I really think that they are some of the deepest and long-lasting contributions that the book makes uh, in really shedding light of trajectories on, of capitalist systems. Uh, Alex has already made a wonderful uh, sum up uh, of the book, so I will probably do it with some different <laughs> words. Uh, so what are these aspects that are really are fundamental to the book? Um, I think really that one of the aspects that struck me as a reader uh, was that uh, the book really is meant to challenge uh, the hidden foundations of much of uh, political economy scholarship. And it's also, also something that Valtra raised. Um, we have become kind of subservient uh, to neoliberal thinking, to its assumptions and policy prescriptions, and the variety of capitalism approach with its uh, emphasis on the supply side logics uh, is testament to that. So basically, we have all come to accept, uh, often probably uncritically, the dominant mainstream uh, neoliberal thinking. Um, the way I'm emphasizing it here is not because I think we are not unaware of it. I think that we are all somehow, uh, you know, oh, cognizant uh, of this problem. Uh, but because uh, probably as political economists, we've taken it for granted somehow. In much more benevolent terms, uh, I've been used to talk about this problem in the past as the little brother syndrome. You know, political economists will look at economies like the, 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 big, the, the little brothers uh, that want to catch up with, with the big one. And so we are in this midst of, uh, you know, um, criticism, but also respect. What I think the editors make uh, a very good point uh, is that the problem is much more profound than uh, a little brother syndrome, right? It's really uh, that uh, this relationship with mainstream thinking has been, become extremely problematic, so much so that we might have lost our critical power, right? So uh, I really appreciate, uh, you know, the book because it really led me to think about how we, may, we always have to look at things from different perspective uh, and not how the others want us to see them. Um, the second aspect uh, that uh, I really liked and it has been already raised uh, uh, in the great comments by the other discussant is this emphasis on the determinants of growth and aggregate demand, right? The, to pay attention to the level of composition of demands, to think about you know, uh, the, the, the strategies that different uh, nations have put in place uh, over time. And at the same time, uh, and especially, uh, of course, I'm biased here as someone coming from IP, I also very much like the idea to go beyond you know, the, the national, right? Uh, and to take into account more uh, the global system, the, the global financial system, system is necessary. I think these are both important correctives uh, to the lenses that we commonly employ, right, when we discuss about the politics of growth. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the editor's point is right. Uh, macroeconomics has been somehow absent uh, in these varieties of capitalism framework. And likewise, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, comparative political economy and international political economy might have been a little bit more sustained <laughs> in the past. Um, third contribution is also something that Alex has already emphasized, uh, and I think rightly so, I completely share, is this uh, pitch for bringing politics back in uh, in a much more sophisticated way than in the past. I really liked, I have to say, the distinction that is done in the introduction um, between the politics of macroeconomic policy making on the one hand and the politics, if you want, of legitimation on the other. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a very well taken point. Uh, it allows us to think about politics um, 
uh, to straddle between two different poles. On the one hand, you know, more elitist politics, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's the usual suspects that make policy making, but on the other hand, also to uh, extend and hand also to electoral politics, right? And really the need to justify uh, in terms of mass politics. These are really great uh, main takeaways and uh, really important questions have already been raised, so I could really just stop my commentary here. Uh, but as you may guess, uh, the insights rates are, are really interesting, and so I cannot pass on the opportunity to raise a couple of questions uh, on my own. And so probably also the colleagues in the audience uh, might want to pick up uh, them and disagree in the discussion. So let me start. Uh, I think I have three um, sets of questions. The one, uh, it's about, uh, uh, you know, also the framing of the book and also where the title of the book probably comes from, you know, the, the notion of uh, diminishing returns. Um, because uh, I think you, you do a, a great job in the introduction in hooking the reader with this important question, uh, because you start with the observation that the main mechanism that have secured legitimacy for democratic capitalism has basically been eroded, you know? capitalist system have been uh, unable over time to produce growth, okay? And, and this, uh, you know, to me was a really, uh, really, really interesting insight. Uh, and it's where I think the title comes from, you know, diminishing returns exactly because, you know, capitalist system have been inexorably uh, been unable to produce growth. But then, you know, the bulk of the book, right, all of the empirical chapters is about, you know, telling us the story, you know, the topology that also Alex was talking about, of how we have national responses to produce growth. Okay, so here I really was, le I, I was really wondering how we have to reconcile, you know, this initial big and important question, okay, what happens if capitalist systems uh, do no longer produce growth? with all the remaining uh, part that is dedicated to how countries cope with diminishing growth, but trying to find a fix and produce their own growth models. So how can we reconcile this position? Uh, can we conclude that countries have somehow found fixes to these diminishing returns problems, although these fixes might be temporary, unstable, not up to the task, but they are still fixes? Or is there something more profound going on? So it's, are we witnessing to this inexorable trend towards diminishing return? And so what are the consequences here? I mean, it's the consequences, the end of capitalism. So what are we exactly predicting here? here? So I, I, I was really left wondering about this uh, big uh, question that uh, it's probably left a little bit unsolved. Um, this leads me to the second question. Okay, the book is, uh, of course, I, mean, I think it was written uh, uh, over the past years. So uh, it has this strong emphasis on secular stagnation, right? And, and rightly so. I mean, uh, I, I completely can, can relate to that. And I agree with you. We have been living in an era where forces spanning from technology to the demography have really combined also to, to bring about stagnation. Um, now, I don't think that these forces have disappeared out of the blue, of course, uh, but uh, let's face it, probably we are entering a different era, right? So I, I, I still do not know where are we going, but it's at least we may want to face the situation that is an inflationary situation that might be completely different from the situation we have experienced over the past decade. So I'm wondering uh, what are the implications here? Is going to change anything in the way you have been thinking about comparative capitalism? And I'm asking this question also because in the introduction you devote uh, a significant attention to the 1970s and how the 1970s and the inflation contributed to the end of the wage-led type of growth, right? So I was wondering whether you expect inflation to kill anything <laughs> in particular now uh, or that uh, we are witnessing uh, it uh, again. And probably related to these big scenario changes, uh, one thing that is probably also somehow missing, of, co of course you have an, a chapter on it, but still in the introduction, I, what was somehow missing is the biggest transition of our time, right? The, the, the green transition. And now it fits uh, in this broader discussion of trajectories of national capitalism. 
The last question I have, probably it's more the theoretical one, <laughs> and so uh, uh, it's about uh, you know the change, okay? Because um, you criticize uh, you know the VOC framework uh, also because of a lack of dynamism, right? And uh, you really want to make the case that uh, we, we see much more instability and, and dynamism uh, in capitalist system. But you know, at the end of the day, as a reader, I couldn't help but have the impression that probably it's also related, it resonates with what Alec was saying about the topology that tends to kind of add some stability, uh, that stability prevails somehow in this capitalist system. So I was really wondering, what is the source of change here? How can we move a capitalist system if they can move from one direction to another. So what are really the engine of change here? Also because if I take your argument uh, to their logical conclusion, all the discussion on dominant growth coalitions, that the way you put it, it's very difficult to undone them, to topple them. So I, I was really left wondering, where does change come about, if it comes about at all? So what, that was really the big question I had uh, in reading uh, the book. Um, it's change coming from the, the external shock or what else? Um, while I was uh, asking this question, I realized that I have a fourth question, actually, that is about this external <laughs> dimension. Uh, and, I, and it's related also to the point that Valtrod was making about Europe. Uh, uh, and I second, I have to say what Valtrot said, but let me add a little bit here. Um, in terms of Europe, where does Europe fit in this whole picture? Especially when you are talking about the IP and the international level, because in the book you have all these, they, you nicely spells out uh, how IP can contribute to CP. Uh, but then I was left wondering, where is the European dimension? Also because, I mean, most of the uh, capitalist systems you analyze are European. So, is the European system, you equate it with the international level, you consider it part already of the domestic level, also because, uh, I mean, Europe is, uh, I think, uh, probably most of us are Europeans in this room, uh, I think, I really cannot see how Europe cannot have a bearing, you know, on the politics of macroeconomic management or on the politics of legitimation that you talk about uh, in the book. So really, where is Europe uh, in all that? Um, I think these are my main reactions and uh, really before ending it over to uh, the audience for comments and, and part of the question, uh, I want really to thank um, the editors uh, and uh, the organizers of the panel for having me here and for having given me the chance to read such an interesting book. Thank you. big ask to ask people to comment on a book, especially on a book like this. And, and I've done a bad job of um, policing the time because comments were so interesting. So we are left a little, a little bit shorter time than I would want to. So I think we are going to give Lucio and Jonas a chance first to respond to these comments um, and hopefully still have some time for the questions from the audience, which we will first take from the room and then from online. So, Lucho or Jonas, whoever wants to start. I suggest that I start, Jonas, and then you, you pick you up. Think, so, the, so, the, so the main thing I want to talk about is typology and the role okay. of typology. So if you can leave some of that for me, that's All right. right. <laughs> I, I will. I, it was also on my list of things to say, but I, I, I happily leave it to you. Uh, first of all, let me thank the three discussants. I, I think uh, it's really a privilege to um, to have such uh, in-depth reading of, of this book. And uh, I have to say that I agree with the, several of these comments, so it's, it's going to be difficult uh, in some cases to push back. Um, but let me try. So on the issue of typologies, I will leave this to uh, Jonas, but just one line. Uh, <laughs> Building a typology was never the main intent here. Actually, the, the reason why we started this is that we wanted to get rid of type of typologists and look at uh, dynamic forces. Uh, but uh, I will add more. Um, yeah, um, then Alex says, uh, okay, this, because of its typological intent, 
uh, turns out to be quite a functional exercise where things fit, fit together um, quite nicely. I have, I disagree. I mean, there's a lot of dysfunctionality in this in this book. I mean, the whole chapter on Latin America is about different types of dysfunctional reliance on uh, commodity-led um, growth models and the chapters on Southern Europe that I co-authored with Buddy Abulfone is about one country that, to put it mildly, completely screwed up, and that's Italy. It has no growth model, it has not had a growth model for 30 years. And then a country that managed to ride a particular consequence of European integration which we call Walters II, but the Walters effect is a famous microeconomic effect that comes from the coexistence in a uh, monetary union of countries with different levels of inflation and a totally unflexible exchange rate that generates, in the case of Walters II, um, a decline of real interest rates, which in Spain become negative, uh, real interest rates, um, which stimulates interest rate sensitive sectors, primarily construction, but also finance, mortgage finance, which finances the uh, construction drive, but penalizes at the same time exchange rate sensitive sectors, manufacturing, which in Spain is little to begin with because Spain has, before joining the Euro, uh, had the possibly good idea of getting rid of its manufacturing sector by privatizing it to uh, foreign companies. Um, and in any case, whatever is left now has to deal with a uh, appreciated real um, exchange rate. The third point that uh, that um, Alex race has to do with fertility and demographic factors. I will not, um, you know, why is immigration absent here? Why don't we have a chapter on immigration? Um, I mean, I will I don't know. I think I think you're right that there should be a chapter on, on immigration, but uh, you know, if you try to cover every possible topic, then you really end up with uh, something that is more a typology, an attempt to systematize everything, than uh, an attempt at uh, uh, creating an, exp an explanatory framework. And I fully agree with the remark that, which was also made by uh, Balkara, that we should not romanticize um, the wage-led growth model because it was built on a particular conception of gender roles. So that's with regard to Alex. Um, and let me move to Waldraut. And Waldraut takes issue with the new Kaleskian inspiration of, of, the, of the framework. I think your bone of contention is more with uh, Stockhammer and Onaran than with ourselves. But anyways, the point is, well, there are different ways of establishing new macroeconomic foundations for an explanatory uh, um, framework which is directed at comparative political economy or political economy scholars more generally. <coughs> And the point that she makes, although I, I have to say that I have to, perhaps if you can send me your written remarks, it would be very helpful. I need to think about what she said. Some of what she said wasn't very clear uh, uh, online, but the point that you seem to make is, uh, uh, you know, perhaps it would have been better to adopt a all Keynesian or just standard Keynesian uh, framework that sees the financial market as the main source of uh, instability in, in capitalism, uh, whereas this idea that the wage share is what's driving growth models is shaky in your opinion because the wage share is not 
uh, exogenous. It is the result of other um, economic dynamics and therefore endogenous itself. I agree with that. I mean, I, I don't think that we are so wedded to the, this particular version of the post Keynesian uh, macroeconomic framework, as you seem to imply. I mean, I don't think that Stokhama himself is so wedded to it. I mean, there is one element in the book which is not very clearly articulated, and that's the distinction between demand drivers of growth and dri ultimate drivers. This is a distinction that um, I am making with co-authors in a more recent um, uh, papers and scholarship. So for us, the demand drivers of growth, the, the most important demand drivers of growth are in theory four. They are consumption, they are investment, they are government expenditures, and exports, not ex net exports, exports adjusting for imports, import adjusted exports. Now, de facto investment led and government led are very, very rare. The two demand drivers, key demand drivers, are consumption and exports, or more generally, domestic demand versus. Uh, foreign demand. Then there is another question. What are the ultimate drivers of this consumption-led, domestic demand-led, or export-led growth? And one of these ultimate drivers could be movement in the, in the wage share. That's the new Kaleski position. Other drivers could be, to take a post strathian perspective, autonomous demand components, or autonomous consumption, uh, and so on and so forth. There could be others, household debt, there could be access to FDI. Some of these are, 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 are explained, are, I mean, are dealt with in the book, but we don't want to imply that movements in the wage share are the only relevant ultimate driver of um, world in, in demand. Um, I have to... Uh, how much time do I have, uh, Sabina? You were kind of out of it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, need, I need five more minutes, is that okay? About <laughs> three. <laughs> okay, uh, well then, um, i just say on the role of the EU, I, in a way, it's it was, this was the only the only remark that I was able to totally predict, <laughs> and I will also say that uh, I completely disagree with your disagreement. And let me just say one thing with regard to Italy. I mean, you say, well, I mean, now Italy is facing a an overappreciated exchange rate, and that's the problem. Well, that, that problem has been there forever, not at all. The problem was not there forever. Uh, I, I don't mean to imply that all, Italy, all of Italy's problems are, re, uh, are linked to the uh, appreciated real exchange rate, which is no longer there, by the way, to, to a much lesser extent. But, you know, when the euro was introduced, Italy came out of, of a huge real exchange rate revaluation between 1995, uh, 1992 and 1995. So no, that's just factually not, not, not true. And with regard to the role of the EU, yes, I mean, if, if the, the EU were the one that you wanted to be, then yes, I would agree with you. That, that's what you need. You need a, a supranational entity that uh, undoes these imbalances that are created at the national level. Unfortunately, it's the exact opposite of that. It actively contributes to creating these imbalances. Uh, Manuela, uh, I really want to do justice to the market because I really like them and they're very stimulating. Let me say that I appreciate the fact that you say that the relationship between political economy and the big brother economics needs to change. And that's one of the goals of the book. We have to stop trying to fill in the gaps, proving that we are compatible and we can do something helpful. And this is really an attempt to say, no, no, 
political economy is the analysis of the economy as if it was a political phenomenon. Macroeconomic policies are policies. They have to be analyzed with the, with the toolbacks of political science or social science more generally. So I appreciate that. Then you have this really interesting question. So if the starting point is secular stagnation, um, the decline of growth, then how come all these, all these uh, chapters are about uh, different types, different ways to solve the problem of lacking aggregate demand? What's, what's missing there? And you know, the, the short answer, and I, I have to be a short answer because I don't have time, is to say that yes, they do solve the problem in some way, although the growth rate is declining and certainly much lower than before, but the solution adds new problems that need to be uh, uh, faced afterwards. Um, a new era, I will not deal with this. I, I, just, I just deal with this. It's not clear to me that we are facing an inflation in new era. I'll just say this. I mean, we have a huge cost push. So raw materials have increased dramatically, just like oil increased uh, in the early 70s and then in the late 70s. But there is one element which is missing for an inflationary era, and that's labor market power. The transformation of these cost increases in wage price spirals. We haven't seen that. I think we are unlikely to see this. We could see a strong monetary response. So, like, a recession which is caused to avoid something which is unlikely to happen. But I would wait before saying we are now in, in, in front of a new inflationary era. And, uh, um, yeah, I totally agree with you that we haven't done enough about the uh, green environmental challenge. We have ch one ch We tried, okay, we tried to find somebody that could write this kind of chapter for us. But we couldn't find it. And I, we think we, the chapter we have, which is about green uh, growth, green industrial policy, is excellent. But perhaps tackling this particular problem, which I agree is the problem uh, of the future, will require a dedicated research project. Anyways, thank you very much. This was uh, really inspiring and uh, uh, and thought to Thank you, Lucio. Jonas, um, you can you can blame him for leaving you just about five minutes before we move questions from the audience. If you have questions, so, so I had a couple of things I wanted to say, but if there are questions online, okay, okay. Let, 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 let's let's give you let's give you five minutes and then okay. uh, and so, questions. so very very quickly, I wanted I wanted to I I too want to thank all the the uh, discussants. Uh, Alex in particular for summarizing the book so well, better than I ever did. Um, and and but but I and I, I don't want to engage with much of the substance. But on this first issue about typologies and Lucho has given the short answer, which is so the way Alex set it up was kind of that there's varieties of capitalism, they have two types, and our and our innovation is that we have six or eight types instead of instead of two and and i and i guess at least the way i think of what we're trying to do here is to actually i so we still we need to classify systems and talk about and have some criteria for classifying growth models but i think in my view at least the key is to kind of treat typologies as being sort of secondary in the research program to me the one of the main problems with varieties of capitalism as a research program is that it became completely preoccupied with defending a particular set of classifications of countries. If Germany was not a coordinated market economy, then this research program would collapse in some sense. And, and in that sense, I think Germany could become a non-export led economy or a balanced economy like Sweden and our research program would still be there. Uh, and and this is not a, just a critique of varieties of capitalism, it's a critique that holds equally well and maybe uh, better for Esping Anderson's welfare state typology, which was a research program entirely based on on defending a particular typology. So so I think that 
So in any case, so, so to me that's a really important part of this is that there are lots of there are types of uh, growth models. We have some kind of ideal types. Lots of countries turn out to be hybrids. There is movement and change, uh, and and I guess this goes to one of Manu Manuela's comments about you know your impression is that this is mostly about stability. Uh, I think, and we perhaps haven't made this clear enough why we think so, but I think we're pretty much committed to the proposition that Germany used to be a, a kind of Swedish-style balanced growth model, exports generated recoveries and recoveries built into domestic uh, wage-led growth, uh, and that something happened between 1990 and 2000 or thereabouts, and and Germany flipped, uh, Sweden did not flip, and that period remains, I would. So in that sense, I think that we, there is actually quite a lot of change, and maybe we should have done a better job trying to identify the many places in the chapters in this book that we would, ident that we would recognize as either transition from one growth model to another, or a kind of fairly major rebalancing of growth models. The last thing I wanted to say was about also on Manuel, like she said, sort of where does Europe fit? Um, I think there is an important part, and it has to do with the chapter on China, which many of us don't talk or we haven't mentioned. Um, but I, so we have country growth, growth models, and some of those country growth models are quite coherent. Others are perhaps less coherent, more hybrid. And then we have a kind of global system, and as somebody said, it's clearly one of our commitments that growth models, export-led and domestic-led, export-led and consumption-led growth models complement each other at the national level. There are also, I think, countries, and China is the best example, but the United States would also be an example, I think, of it, kind of a confederation of growth models, if you wish, uh, and, and, so, and, you know, and, and I think, so the EU and the Eurozone, we could think of it either as a global mechanism of coordinating national level growth models, but we could also think of it as, as a kind of regional configuration of growth models, not perhaps not so unlike uh, the US and China. And I will stop right there. Excellent. Thank you, Jonas. So Alex, um, you would have to come and tell us how many questions you have in the room. Um, and, and for people online, if you can just raise your hand so I can see you, we will first take those from the room um, and try to, we have about 15 minutes. Um, to. Yeah, Sabina have adopted an authoritarian approach and have designated three people to, to not waste time. So we can start with Alessia Spide. Thank you very much. Alessia from the Leiden University. My question is on the micro foundations of growth models. There's a chapter, I know about this, but my question is, should we observe different preferences towards the management of the economy in different growth models? And if we don't, because I think that what the... Uh, Thomas uh, Sattler and Evelyn Umscher chapter suggests is that this is not the case, so how can we justify these growth models electorally? Thank you very much. Can we the next question? Maybe Jonathan Seidlin. Thanks very much uh, for great uh, comments and, uh, and responses, which uh, help to enable those of us who have not read the book to at least think we have an idea of what might be being argued. So my question or you know, provocation is to ask whether there might not be a problem with this new framework which lies precisely in the things that it has in common with varieties of capitalism, and that is the focus on uh, the national economy as the primary unit. And I wonder if there isn't a risk uh, that you uh, overstate both the internal and external uh, coherence of national uh, economic models. Um, internally, in terms of, for example, regional differences, which obviously are very uh, important, 
um, in the case of, uh, of Italy, but also Germany. And perhaps this is something that uh, Jonas was alluding to by the idea of saying that um, you know, the United States or China or maybe the Eurozone are actually uh, you know, confederations of different uh, sub-components. Uh, but external, I think, is even uh, more important. I mean, obviously, it's one thing to take an international political economy approach and look at the interactions between um, national policies and national uh, economies. But the, the question about immigration, uh, the questions about Europe, we could add about um, you know, multinational investment and uh, cross-border uh, capital flows. These are all about to what extent, I mean, how far can you really conceive of uh, national uh, growth models in a, uh, a, a self-enclosed uh, way? And certainly, I think that to conceive of the EU um, as an international setting uh, today does not make uh, a lot of sense. Um, for instance, let's just jump to the last point. Uh, if we're going to ask how uh, are different uh, national economies going to respond to uh, the green transition, it's clear that the policies uh, of the European Union are going to be central to that. Um, and it's not going to be possible to analyze those choices purely uh, at a, a national level. So, uh, you know, have you overcome uh, methodological nationalism or is there a bit of a mirroring of a central <coughs> defect of the VOC approach? Okay, my question, uh, I look forward to reading the book. Um, this seems very exciting to me. My question has to do with the normative and practical motivations or perhaps the theoretical assumptions that underlie this project. And I wonder to what extent we can today really say that growth, economic growth in advanced capitalism, so Netherlands, uh, countries of Northern Europe, is truly associated with legitimacy and social stability. That is not clear to me. That uh, the situation in Italy uh, is terrible after 30 years of stagnation is obvious, but is growth really, um, does it still play that role? Um, uh, is it even necessary? Per perhaps, it seems to me, perhaps, um, it certainly seems to me that it's insufficient for social stability. That seems quite obvious. Perhaps you could uh, offer your reflections on that. Thank you. <coughs> Can I just say one thing in the in reply to Daniel's last comment? Yes, go ahead. I, I, I think it's a tough question and I don't have a simple answer. I think the one thing I know is that incumbent parties get re-elected when there is economic growth. Uh, and that is as true today, in fact, according to a couple of papers I read yesterday, it is more true in the 2010s than it was before the global financial crisis, that, 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 that people are much more likely to vote for uh, sitting governments when growth is high or good or whatever you want to call it. Do we have any more questions, Alex? Are we taking any more? Yeah, we have Sebastian. Okay, we'll take that one and then give the author's chance to respond. Uh, I'm glad I made it to the microphone. Um, congratulations on, on the book. I can't wait to read it. And I guess since we haven't all had a chance to read it, this is why we're a bit compiling a shopping list of sort of elephants in the room. And in the end, we'll have more elephants than room. But one other that I had in mind, apart from climate, gender, um, and migration, which are extremely important, is uh, digitalization, technological change, uh, etc. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because it seems that the, um, well, sort of uh, uh, founding parents of VOC are now focusing more on that under the headline of the knowledge economy and so on. And I'm just curious 
what you what your views are on that, what your take is on that, and actually, of course, the foundation of VOC was to make a point about innovation. Uh, and I agree that this is quite neoclassical, that change only comes from these exogenous technological shocks, etc. But we seem, or we happen to have a rather major uh, technological sh shock that affects everyone, but probably differently. So what's your take on that, basically, uh, perennial question of innovation? Um, and maybe it's in the book. I saw that there's a chapter uh, by Hermann Schwartz on uh, intellectual property and so on. So I just look forward to reading that. Thanks. Okay, so shall we have a look to and your next response? Luke, you go. I, I will pass. Uh, Jonas, I feel better. I took more time, so don't worry. Okay. Don't worry. All right, so I'll. Uh, do you want to answer Alessia's question about how we justify world models intellectually, or should I do that? I, I think we should. We okay. only have four minutes left. You go. <laughs> okay, okay. Alessia. If, 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 if it's the last panel, um, and if people are happy to stay a couple of minutes longer, I think it's fine. Okay. Alessia, the idea here is that um, um, we don't assume that electors have defined preferences over growth models. On the contrary, we think that growth models, at least the policies that are the foundations of growth models, are much less salient uh, than uh, it would be necessary for electors to form clear preferences about uh, growth models and the, the underlying key policies and that the key uh, politics of the growth model is, in a way, quiet politics. Electoral politics does matter, but it does matter uh, with some exceptions. Well, uh, Sweden is one of the exceptions in moments of crisis. Moments of crisis in which there is either prolonged stagnation or there is a sudden uh, decline of uh, growth performance such that some political entrepreneurs through the media starts politicizing key issues for the world model, which then become the object of the electoral co uh, competition. Uh, with um, uh, jo uh, uh, Jonathan's question, uh, how, don't we share too much with uh, with um, a variety of capitalism, and particularly particularly an emphasis on, on the national economy? as the key unit of analysis? Yes, this is the one thing that we, we share with uh, writers of capitalism. Which means some authors don't agree, including one of the editors. Not right. Like. But I think the other two editors would, at least I would tell you, I think the only would say, would say that yes, we still believe that the national economy is a good starting place for some questions. What are these questions? The questions that have to do with policies like macroeconomic policy that are determined at the national level and increasingly at the uh, international level in the case of the euro the eurozone but i fully agree with you that perhaps the next challenge the challenge the green transition will not be played actually it's impossible to, to address that issue at the, at the national level so i'm sorry if this looks like i'm i'm, I'm dodging the question but uh, i mean so far, I would say that the national level of an analysis has proved um, the right starting point for what we want to do, but I am ready to change um, my starting point. Daniel, is, uh, Daniel I think uh, Jonas has already responded to, to you. Um, and Sebastian, digital digitalization, techno techno technological change, um, so we take a distinct post-Keynesian position on the issue of technical change, which, as you know, it is at the foundation of neoclassical growth models. Neoclassical growth models are all about demographic forces, saving rates, and technical change, either exogenous or endogenous. Endogenous means that technical change, change, uh, change is determined by investments in R&D, investments in human capital. We think that technical change is largely the result of 
demand-side politics. And the chapter that you mentioned by Mark Schwartz, which I strongly encourage everybody to read, is a response to this emerging literature on um, the knowledge economy, presented as a summation of developments taking place on the supply side of the economy. Uh, widespread education, diffusion, and more literate uh, voters, um, demographic uh, change, and so on and so forth. The knowledge economy becomes the result of a set of legal slash political shifts, in particular, the diffusion and a particular regime of protection of international uh, property rights. Uh, I'm done. Yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I just say one thing? Uh, and I, my guess is that everybody in the room has already figured this out. Um, there is a lot of stuff going on in the book, and there are a lot of contributors who don't necessarily buy into post-Keynesian economics or, or any number of things, right? There is, and Baltrow um, kind of criticizes for lack of pluralism, and maybe in the domain of macroeconomics we are guilty of lack of pluralism, but I think that among our authors there is a lot of, there is a lot of different takes on issues such as technological change and country level versus global units of analysis or whatever. So, so as you will read this book, you will, I mean, like any book of this sort, including varieties of capitalism of 2000 or 2001, I can't remember which, there are the editors who are trying to kind of create a coherent uh, framework, and then there are lots of contributors who have often have their own uh, agenda or their own research program. Uh, so, so it is, I think, a, a pretty diverse book in many ways. And, and I think we, in this discussion, we've covered most of the themes that the various chapters had in common, and we have not yet and couldn't possibly have discussed where they differ from each other in terms of emphasis or, or actual disagreements on, on specific points. Thank you, Jonas. We are, we are at the end of scheduled time. I'm going to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to the discussants for today.